Good morning, church family. It's great to see you here. It's also great to have so many of you joining us online. Welcome once again. What we're doing today is we're starting a new series entitled God at Home. And there's a reason for that because, quite frankly, as we look around uh, and, and we see problems and struggles, we realize that we need right now God at home more than ever. And we're going to be talking in this series about marital relationships as well as about parenting relationships and just relationships in general. So today we're going to be looking at that. We're going to be looking at, well, at, at this point, marriage and, and divorce and what does God say? What do we do? You know, I was reading quite a bit this week about the pandemic and the divorces that have come from this pandemic. You know, the joke is, you can write this out and you can see it, the joke is you can't spell divorce without COVID. And uh, it's, it's actually true, you know, so that's, that's kind of the running joke. But Wuhan, where this, where, where this virus came steam, actually divorces have doubled this year. In America, divorces are up 34% since the stay-at-home order uh, was issued in, in March, uh, mid-March. And so up that much, 34% divorces are up. And the biggest reason for the divorces are these. The lockdown has called, irre, caused irreparable damage to our relationship. That's, that's the biggest single reason why these things are happening. It's almost like, well, we're stuck together now. We haven't been stuck together for a while. And we realize we really don't like each other. And we really can't work our way through issues. You know, also on steep rise since March is people typing in these words to Google, I want a divorce. You know, uh, there's an article that came out, you can look it up for yourself, came out in September 2nd, and, and it was entitled, The Seven Issues That Have Doomed Divorce During the Pandemic. And, and if you read through it, basically what it comes down to, all seven of these issues, it comes down to one single point. And the single point is, is we don't like being stuck together because we have to work through things that we, re we really don't want to work through. And, and so here we go, and here we have this entire issue that's now plaguing not just our country, but our world today. So today we're going to talk about healing. We're going to talk about healing brokenness in home. We're going to be talking about healing in our marriage. If we're married, we're also going to be talking about healing if we've been divorced. And, and how do we grasp hold of healing even then? And so healing brokenness in the home, there's no better passage to go to than Matthew 19, 3 through 8. So if you've got a Bible, turn to Matthew 19, verses 3 through 8. Hold your Bible open. And what I'm going to do today is I'm just going to kind of walk through these verses, specifically Jesus' interaction with Pharisees who were trying to trap him by asking him about divorce. And, uh, and in doing so, Jesus lays out really the importance of marriage, the problem with divorce, and then he alludes to the God who heals, and those are going to be the three things that we look at today. So listen to what the exchange says here in Matthew 19. Some Pharisees came to Jesus to test him. They asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? N notice how they phrase that. That's important. I'll come back to that. Haven't you read, he replied, that at the beginning the Creator made them male and female, and said, for this reason, a man will leave his mother and father and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Why then, they asked, did Moses command that a man give his wife a certificate of divorce and send her away? Jesus replied, Moses permitted. Notice the words again to you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard, but it was not that way in the beginning. So we're going to be looking at those three things today. Once again, the importance of marriage, the problem with divorce, and the God who heals. So let's take a look at point one, the importance of marriage. And go back to verse three and notice what's happening. Some Pharisees came to test him. Now the Pharisees are the scripture scholars of the day. These are the people that know Scripture backwards and forwards. Their Scripture is our Old Testament. It is Scripture. They memorized the entire Old Testament. They had it all down. They, they knew it all. Not only did they memorize it, but they would quote it to each other. They would speak it. They would, they would study the words. They would recite these words. And these scriptural scholars come to Jesus to test him, 
asking him about divorce. Because in that day, there were two basic camps on divorce. You had what was called the Hillel camp that basically said, you can get divorced for pretty much whatever reason you want. And then you had the Shammai camp that said, you can hardly ever, ever, ever get divorced, only for extreme reasons. And so you had two camps of the day, and they're coming to Jesus to basically say, what camp are you in? Because whatever camp he claims to be in, then they're going to pigeonhole him, and, and they're going to attack him based on whatever camp that he chooses. But I love how he responds. He says three words, and go back to verse 3, and notice what he says, haven't you read? Haven't you read? And this is really important, and we need to hear these words today as well. In other words, what he is saying is, uh, go back to Scripture. Don't go to someone's opinion on Scripture. Don't go to the Hillel opinion. Don't go to the Shammai opinion. Don't go to the Calvinist or the Arminian opinion. Don't go to this opinion or that opinion. Go back to Scripture itself. Haven't you read, he says. And basically what he is saying is, you and I might tend to do this. We tend to make people's opinions on Scripture our authority, and Jesus is saying, no, make Scripture your authority. Go back to the Bible. What does the Bible say? And that's exactly what he's calling them to do, and exactly what they aren't doing. Haven't you read, Jesus replied, verse 4, that at the beginning, God made the Creator, made them male and female. And, and, and by the way, who is the Creator? If you go to John chapter 1... Uh, he's cloaking himself, it's Jesus. Uh, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, he was with him in the beginning. Through him all things were made. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus was there, and Jesus is saying, let's go back to Genesis 2, let's go back to Scripture, let's go back to the beginning when they were made, male and female, and he takes us to Genesis chapter 2, verses 18 and on. Now, I'm not going to have you go there, but I'll just mention a few things that Jesus is drawing their attention to. In Genesis 2.18, God looks out at Adam and, and he says, it is not good. For the first time, God sees Adam's situation and says, it is not good. He looks at the world, he looks at the vegetation, he looks at the animals, he looks at, he looks at the universe and says, it is good. It is good, it is good. But he looks at Adam and Adam is alone and he says, it is not good that man should be alone, I will make a helper suitable for him. And before you think that women are created subservient, they aren't, the word helper is, is the word neged, which means equal, opposite, counterpart. And so God is saying, I'm going to make someone equal to you that's going to be a counterpart for you. And the word helper doesn't mean, doesn't mean servant necessarily, it means azer. It's something that God is. Psalm 121, I turn my eyes to the hills, where does my azer, my help come from? Or oftentimes in Scripture, if people were remembering God's help for them, they would put an Ebenezer, a stone of help, down as a, as, as a Eben means stone, Azer means help, a stone of help down as a memory for what God had done for them. And, and, and that's, that's what they would do. And so God is saying, I'm going to make you a helper, an equal opposite counterpart that is going to be uh, someone that will be with you and compliment you this is my plan for marriage. And that's what he takes us back to, Genesis 2.18. You know, abuse and polygamy, by the way, because a lot of people say, well, what happened? You know, I mean, how come women ended up be being chattel almost? And how come polygamy started? Well, that started because of sin hundreds of years after Adam and Eve. You see the degeneration within the generations from generations and what sin does, and you see abuse settling in. And you see polygamy settling in, but that's not God's plan. This is God's plan. One man, one woman joined together in a marriage. That's, that's God's plan. It was God's plan then, and it continues to be God's plan today. And in Genesis 2, verse 25, we are told that they were both naked, Adam and Eve were, and unashamed. And this is important. You know, we, we think of naked physically or sexually. It's also talking about being completely vulnerable emotionally being completely vulnerable spiritually, being completely vulnerable and open before each other, and they were unashamed. They were open. They weren't closed off. They weren't hiding yet behind fig leaves. They, they, they weren't running yet trying to, to, to defend themselves. They were created to be naked 
and unashamed. Now, this tells us God's plan for marriage for us. It's to have this intimacy in marriage that goes way beyond sexuality. It goes into the level of, uh, of coming together as one on every level. This is God's plan. This is God's intent for marriage. This is the way it was, and Jesus is taking these biblical scholars back there and saying, you've got it wrong. Let me tell you, let me tell you what it was to be in the beginning. And so Jesus is saying four things about marriage, and let me just kind of run through these four things. The first thing is this, marriage is a covenant relationship. It is a covenant relationship. So they were both naked and unashamed, and this intimacy of being completely open and honest and vulnerable and transparent with each other only flows from a covenant relationship. Now, if you've been around me before and you've heard me talk about marriage, you've probably heard me talk about the difference between consumer-based marriages and covenant-based marriages. Many marriages that we look at today are what I would call consumer-based marriages. A consumer-based marriage is basically this. I'm in this marriage as a consumer, and as long as my needs are met, I'm going to stay in this marriage. But as soon as my needs aren't met, I'm out of here. That's a consumer-based marriage. A covenant-based marriage is what God's design is. It's this. I am in this marriage, listen to these words, for better or worse, for richer, for poor, in sickness and in health, until death does us part. I'm in this marriage whether my needs are met or not. I'm in this covenant whether my needs are met or not, whether I'm feeling good about it or not. I'm in it no matter what because I have committed to a covenant and I'm rising above becoming a consumer and I am a person of covenant. And consequently, by the way, there are two covenants. If you've heard me do the teaching on Wednesday night, you heard me mention this, but there are two covenants. One covenant is the marriage covenant that God instituted. The other covenant is the relationship God has with us. And, and it's, for no, it's for no reason. I, I think about it. It's, it's, it's for good reason that, that the church is called the bride of Christ and Jesus is called the groom. And, and everything that we see with the end times plays itself out within the, the context of an ancient Jewish wedding. And because this issue of covenant is this, we are to learn to be people of covenant in marriage, and that teaches us about our relationship ultimately with God. But we enter into marriage not as consumers, we enter into it as people of covenant. C.S. Lewis said these words. He said, unless you're willing to make a complete personal commitment to somebody from whom you are asking a complete bodily commitment, then you don't really want that person. You want an experience. And that person is a necessary commodity. And you're dehumanizing that person. You know, those words couldn't even be more true today if you think about it. You know, this is what happens when we engage in sex outside of the covenant of marriage. We end up starting out as consumers and we end up engaging in this. And, and, and if you're in a consumer relationship, you can't be completely honest and open and vulnerable. Because, because the relationship is not a covenant. You haven't committed to each other for better or worse, richer for poor, in sickness and in health, and you can't have genuine intimacy within a consumer-based relationship. Uh, and here's why all the statistics show that people who actually engage in sex before marriage have a difficult time in marriage. Uh, they, they're actually like twice as likely to divorce in marriage because it's so hard to move from a consumer to a person of covenant. Make sense? It doesn't mean you can't, it means it's just harder. Because now you have to flip a switch and you've got to do things differently and you've got to approach it differently. So marriage is a covenant relationship. Secondly, marriage is maturing. Don't you know that? Uh, this is actually, marriage is one of the ways God uses to grow us up. I found that out firsthand, I'll talk about that. But here's what Jesus says in verse five. He says, for this reason, because of the marriage covenant, for this reason, a man will leave his mother and father and unite, cleave to his wife. See, when you are married, you are now more tied to your spouse than to your parents. When you are married, this now becomes your prominent, your, your most pronounced relationship. You, you have left your home of origin. You have left everything about that home of origin. You still love your parents, certainly, but now you're in a new, stronger relationship with your spouse. And that's what he is saying. We will leave and we will cleave. And a part of leaving is maturing, quite frankly, and setting aside patterns and setting aside behaviors 
from our own family of origin and, and letting God grow us. Now, I've talked about this before, but Deanna and I had some really rough first years, probably first decades, to be honest. And, uh, and, and part of what made it rough was the fact that we came into our covenant relationship, we came into this marriage bringing in expectations from our childhood homes. And, and one thing that we have to do is we have to leave our mother and father and our childhood homes and the behaviors and patterns, and we have to cleave and create a new normal with our spouse. Uh, and so, for example, Jesus, uh, De Deanna tells this story. When, when, she's, when she's talking about expectations she had of me, she wanted me to be like her father. Uh, if the plumbing went out, her father would fix it. If a shingle was off, the father would get up on the roof and, and fix it. If, if the electrical work was, was messed up, the fa her father would fix it. I anything, you know, the, the car needed working on, he would change the oil, he would even repair the car. And she's looking at me saying, go do it. And I'm looking at her saying, you don't want me to do that. Uh, you, you don't, and I'm the guy that orders a bike for my kid and after four hours, you know, it comes in a box, and after four hours, I've completely damaged the whole thing. And, it's, and it never works after that. I just can't do it. I've, for some reason, I, I don't think mechanically in that way. But somewhere in, in our second decade together, Deanna started realizing, wait a minute, I can do the plumbing. I do electrical work. Uh, I know how to fix cars. Uh, I know it's really weird, but every power tool in my house belongs to my wife. Every one. I, the chainsaw's mine, and I keep messing that one up. But, but everything else belongs to my She does all this. She, she, you know, if our plumbing goes out, she's, she's laying up under the pipes, and she's doing it. If electrical work, she's up in the attic, and she's rerunning the wires. I mean, she, you don't want me to do it, but, but she does it. Her expectation was, you're going to be that person, and, and then consequently, I had expectations of her. You know, and my expectations were you're going to kind of like be like my mom and be helpful in these particular ways with regard to cooking and ironing and cleaning, and, 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 and she doesn't do any of that. Uh, I mean, she'll cook occasionally, but not much. And so I, I, I actually am not a bad cook. And, and not only that, I clean really well, and, and I do laundry, I, and, I, and I iron, and I sew. I, I know I kind of feel a little unmanly sometimes admitting that, but, but, but here, here we are in our marriage coming together and we're realizing we've got to mature past these expectations and become one, one flesh. And, and, and that's, that's actually been a maturing process where we have had to leave our childhood expectations from our childhood homes and create a new normal. And that's what God wants of us as we enter into this covenant of, of marriage. The C, uh, the, the third thing, Jesus is telling us this about marriage, that marriage is the strongest possible relationship. So a man will leave his mother and father and cleave and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh, and one flesh is stronger than the parent-child relationship. Some of us are in a marriage, and we haven't figured that out yet. But one flesh means I, I am more tied to my spouse than I am my parents. By the way, one flesh means I am more tied to my spouse than I am to my children. I am not one flesh with my children, but I am one flesh with my husband, with my wife. I am one flesh because this is a relationship unequal to any other relationship. And this is how God has designed it. God has created us to move into this. We are actually fused together as one flesh in everything. Plans, goals, wins, commitments, losses, finances, debts, pains, joys, this is what it is to be one flesh. I often do marriage counseling and, and premarital counseling, and, I, and, and this actually holds true to today. Uh, very rarely do I see couples actually succeeding if they have separate checking accounts. I, I, I know that there probably are some that do it, but, but it, it's so difficult because, because God says, I want you to become one flesh in everything. Everything, everything is fused together. That's what this relationship is about. And then lastly, Jesus is telling us that marriage is binding. Therefore, what God has joined together. And notice who does the joining. God does the joining. What God has joined together. He's not only instituted marriage, but whether you know God or not, he is joining you together in your marriage. This is, this is his plan. This is what he has created us to be like one man, one wife coming together, being joined together in marriage, he instituted it, 
and he made it to be a covenant relationship. And know this, when you move in marriage, God moves. I've heard people say, well, I, I made a mistake. I, I ended up marrying my, my spouse, and I really, really didn't wait for God to bring the right one along. I, I missed marrying my soulmate, and so I need to get divorced so that I can find my soulmate. Or I, I think maybe I found my soulmate. She works in my office or something like that. And I've, I've actually had people have these conversations with me, and, and what they're saying is this. You know what? There's one person out there that God wants you to marry, and you've got to do the hard work of finding that one person. And once you find that person, there isn't going to be any, any problem, any, any maturing problems that you're going to have. It's going to be easy going from then on out. That's, that's a lie. The, the truth is, is marriage is always hard work, no matter who you marry. C c compatibility is a, is a myth. Uh, we are all incompatible, and, and, and we mature as we grow through with God's love. And in and, and, and this covenant, we mature. But, but back to that myth, you know, I've got to find the one, my soulmate, you know, that people say. You know, if that were true, and let, let's say that you had one person out there that God wanted you to marry, but you don't marry them. So if, if, if Deanna wasn't, you know, that one person God wanted me to marry, I, I messed up the man who should have married Deanna. I messed up his life. Uh, I messed up the life of the woman that I should have married. Not only that, but I messed up the life of the man who married the woman that I should have married. And I messed up the life of the woman who married the man that my wife should have married. Does that make sense? And to a certain extent, it's like a domino effect that can go all across the world. And with one wrong choice in marriage, we can create and wreak havoc. God doesn't give us that kind of power. Here's what God does. He says, I want you to choose. And when you choose, that becomes my will for your life. Once you move into this marriage, she, men, he, ladies, becomes God's will for your life. That, that now becomes God's will. That relationship now becomes his will, and now you do the hard work of, of really fusing your lives together. So let me get to the problem with divorce. That's marriage, but what does Jesus say about divorce? Matthew 19, 7 and 8, let me read these words again. Why then, they asked, did Moses command that a man give his wife a certificate of divorce and send her away? Jesus replied, Moses permitted you to divorce because your hearts were hard, but it was not this way in the beginning. So let me mention three things about divorce. You know, Jesus reminds us that divorce uh, or the marriage is two people becoming one flesh. So divorce is this. Divorce is the ripping apart of flesh. I mean, think about this. Uh, if God fuses us together as one, this is why divorce is so painful. Uh, don't, don't do this when you go home, but if you were to take scissors and cut open you know, a piece of your own flesh and start ripping it apart, uh, it would be very painful, wouldn't it? And, and it would bleed, and it would hemorrhage, and you would have to go to the ER very quickly. And, and if it's not sewn up, it will infect, and it could probably kill you if, if it's not sewn up. This is what divorce is. Divorce is taking flesh and ripping it apart. It, it's like tearing flesh. And whenever you tear flesh, it leaves an open wound. Whenever you tear flesh, it bleeds. Whenever you tear flesh, if it's not healed, it infects. And, and don't you know that it's the same way with divorce? Flesh is ripped apart. It leads a bleeding open wound that needs to be healed. And, and, and it has to be healed. If we don't let God heal it, the infection of bitterness and cynicism, the, the, the infection of, 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 of godlessness in many other ways is going to set in. And, and it's going to create further damage. And it, but God does heal the wounds. We'll talk about that. But it leads this open wound. And by the way, it doesn't just leave an open wound on the husband and wife. It also leaves an open wound on the children of divorce. And statistics tell us that the children of divorce rise to the top of every negative social problem that our world has. Everything from drug abuse to suicide to promiscuity to teen pregnancy to everything else. And because why? Because it's left an open wound. And unless it's healed and healed by God, you know, that open wound will drive us. Here's our tendency with an open wound. 
wow, I've been divorced, I've got an open wound, I need to find someone to help heal that wound for me. And so we jump into another relationship thinking that another relationship is going to somehow heal this wound when only God can do that. But this is what divorce is. Divorce rips apart flesh. Secondly, divorce comes from a hardened heart. Here's what he says. Moses permitted divorce because your hearts were hard. And so what Jesus says is this. Divorce happens because at some point, one of the two partners in the marriage, one or both of them, end up hardening their hearts. And it's a hardened heart that remains selfish. It's a hardened heart that can't forgive. It's a hardened heart that insists on a consumer, not a covenant-based relationship. It's a hardened heart that justifies an affair. It's a hardened heart that excuses the abuse. It's a hardened heart that settles in, that creates this rift that ultimately leads to the ripping apart of flesh. A lot of pain awaits those who harden their hearts. And then the third truth about divorce is this. Divorce isn't God's plan. Notice how Jesus ends in verse 8. He says, it wasn't that way in the beginning. It wasn't that way to start with. This wasn't God's plan, in other words. God's plan for marriage and family never included divorce. The husband and wife were to become one flesh, and the children were to be raised and guided with, with both of them present. But because of the hardness of hearts, now we have uh, the rending, the tearing of flesh in people all over. So what is Jesus saying? Well, let me just mention three things before I move on. Don't treat divorce lightly. That's what he's saying. Secondly, he's saying don't use divorce as a way to solve your problems. And thirdly, n notice what Jesus is saying. Don't ask the question what is legal. Ask the question what is right. And this is actually quite important for us. You see, <laughs> That the question of legal and the question of right are, well, extremely important. Government determines what is legal. God determines what is right. I mean, don't you know that? And, and whatever the government determines isn't necessarily right. But God determines right. Government determines legal. Here's another question Jesus would have us ask. If God joins us together in a marriage, how can a judge in a courtroom dissolve it? And I think we should ask that question. I think Jesus is leading us to ask that question. You know, he, he's not denying that divorces don't have, you know, he's not denying a divorce. What he's saying is, I want you to ask these difficult questions. I don't want you to treat it lightly. So where do we go from here? The truth is, we go to the God, number three, who heals. So we've seen marriage for what it is, divorce for what it is. Now we need to go to God who heals. And let me just mention a few things as we come to God, our healer. If I'm married, if you are watching, if you are here today, and you are married, let me give you three things to do. First thing is this, remove the divorce option. If you were married, let me encourage you, take divorce off the table. I mentioned this, but uh, I, I wish it were not so. I wish I had a different story to tell. But I brought divorce up in the first few years of marriage with Deanna. And I just watched her... I watched her wilt, literally, as I brought that up. And, and I, I, uh, all of a sudden, the covenant of marriage where we could be intimate with each other on all levels, that, that just kind of washed away as she looked at me pursuing a consumer-based relationship. Does that make sense? And it took years to heal through me bringing up divorce. Because if divorce is on the table, let me just tell you, God's love is off the table. Because God's love keeps no record of wrongs. Read 1 Corinthians 13. God's love never fails. God's love is, is patient and kind. And, uh, and, and this is God's love. And if divorce is on the table, God's love can't be on the table. I, I, I can't see other way around it. Now, now granted, yeah, the divorce does happen. But if you're married right now, take divorce off the table. Don't let it be an option. The second thing to do if you're married and you're hurting in marriage is this, grow closer to God. Now, I need to tell you that I have a deep and growing love for Deanna, my wife, and I must admit that when we started out in marriage, even in my 20s and 30s, uh, I didn't have this deep, growing love. I, I loved her, but not the way I love her now. 
And, and, and that's the beauty of it, because I'm watching in me. I'm watching God grow me and change me, even in how I relate to my wife. And, and, and what, what has changed? Quite frankly, I've grown closer to God. And as I've grown closer to God, I love more. And as I grow closer to God, I forgive more, and I focus on Deanna more in our marriage. I'm less interested in me and more interested in her. That this is what happens as I grow closer to God. And then I do things for her, not because I have to, but because I want to. So, so kind of, I, I make coffee for her every morning. That's, that's one way of, uh, I bring it to her, or we sit out together and spend time together. I'll make her breakfast, and I'll, I'll make sure that, since I get up earlier, that this happens. I don't do that because I have to. I look forward to doing these things for her. It's actually something I want to do. I, I take joy in us sitting together in the mornings. I, I pray over her every day and, and pray for her. I didn't do that when we started out, but it's something that I do now, and there, there's something that has grown. And, and you say, well, what's happened? Well, the truth is, is I haven't grown closer to Deanna, and I have, but it's not, because I've ne- it's not because she's become more lovable, although she's very lovable. It's because God has made me more loving. Does that make sense? Uh, t- take a look at this chart that it's, it's the chart of a triangle. We're going to put it up on screen here. And this basically shows us the marriage relationship and what God intends for us to really, to, to really grow and thrive. So this chart, as you look at it, you've got the husband and the wife down below. And it's a triangle, and Christ is at the top. And when it comes to identity and security and fulfillment and meaning and joy and all these things that we try to get from each other, once we start finding them in God... We end, up, we end up actually growing closer to each other. So think, think of this chart and, and think of it this way. As you progress, so look, look at those lines that go up to Christ. As you grow closer to, so husband and wife here, and here's Christ. As you grow closer to Christ, the distance between the two of you lessens. And that's the point. As we grow closer to him, as we mature in him, the space between us it becomes shorter. And now we can love more. Now we can forgive more. Now we want to love, not because of selfish reasons, but because of selfless reasons. And and this is what God does in us. God grows us in this way. You see, marriage involves three, not just two. And it involves growing closer to him. Third thing that we need to do in marriage is this. Look for God to make a way. So if you're in a marriage right now, and you're struggling, and you're thinking, I don't know how we're going to make it. Don't you know that God is a God of miracles? We sung about it today. Don't you know that God is a God who makes a way where there isn't a way? And, and, and here's a part of faith. I, I'm, every now and then I have people coming to me saying, uh, Pastor, why did God give me these urges if he didn't want me to act on them? You know, what, 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 why is God bringing this situation in my life if he's not wanting me to live it out? Uh, and and the, the point is, is that God wants us to be faithful to him. And he wants us to take our lives and our situations and surrender them to him so that he can make a way. This is what faith is all about. Faith is saying, God, I surrender my life wholly to you so that you can make a way for me. Instead of me trying to make my own way, I'm going to surrender my life wholly to you so that you can make a way. And I'm going to trust that you will make a way. And I'm going to wait for you to make a way. And I'm going to thank you when you do make a way. Uh, if any marriage should have failed, it was mine. But God made a way. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't trade the relationship I have with Deanna with anything. God made a way. God can make a way in your life as well. So if I married those three things, now let me address if I'm divorced. You know, here is what God would say to us if we've been divorced. First of all, allow God to heal the brokenness. Let God heal the tearing apart of flesh. If you've been divorced, it's an open wound. The temptation and all of your friends, chances are, are going to tell you, go get yourself back on the market. Go, go find someone else, you know. Go let, go let the next person try to heal the wound that you have from this person. And th- that couldn't be more hurtful, actually. You know, what we need to do instead of looking for another relationship to heal us is we need to look for Jesus to be our healer. We need to look for him to heal us. Listen to Psalm 147, verse 3. It says, he heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. 
that this is what God does. And, and you're going to love the Hebrew for healing and binding. Heals is the word rafa, which means to stitch up what is bleeding. Think of the open wound that divorce leads. You know, th think of the open wound. Healing, rafa, to stitch up and stop the bleeding. And then binding is the word kobash, which means to wrap. So he stitches up our wounds, and then he binds them. He wraps them for us. He, here's what God wants to do if you've been divorced. He wants to stitch up that open wound. He wants to stop the bleeding. He wants to eliminate the infection. He wants to be the one who stitches and binds. Not someone else, not another experience, not another marriage. He wants to be the one to do this. You know, some of us have been divorced, and it wasn't our choice. And maybe we're listening to this, and we're feeling pretty miserable as I talk about marriage and divorce. And it could be that you were betrayed by a spouse. It could be you were abandoned by a spouse, and, and you didn't have a choice in the matter. And they hardened their hearts, and, and it just kind of left you, but it still left you with an open wound. You know, let, let me encourage you to seek that forgiveness, because God wants to stitch up that open wound, and He wants to heal it. And then some of us who were listening have been divorced, but we are the ones who did the betraying or the abandoning. And we are the ones that caused this, and here we are now living with the guilt of it. And now the open wound is there, and how do we now deal with the open wound, not only from the divorce, but from the fact that we brought it about, and that maybe we were the cause of this? You know, I've heard Christians say, well, if your marriage is hard work, go find another. God will forgive you if you ask him, but it doesn't work that way. Forgiveness follows repentance. And God says, I want you to repent. And, and I want you to be genuinely sorry for what you have done and, and, and come to me with a genuine sorrow for your sin so that I can now put your feet back on the right track. And I can now heal you and re-engage my will for your life. You see, God wants to do this no matter where we've been. You know, whatever caused the divorce wound, if not taken care of, it will lead to bitterness and shame and destructive patterns. But healing of wounds takes time. Give God time to heal. I want to end with a word of hope, and I'll do so quickly. But Jesus actually goes out of his way to see this woman in Samaria who has been married five times and is now living with someone who's not her husband. And if you read John chapter 4, the story of the good, uh, of not the good Samaritan, but the Samaritan woman, if you read John 4 and you, and you see that story, you see that Jesus actually seeks her out, goes out of his way to let her know that he can quench the thirsting of her soul. And when he brings up Yes, you've been married five times, and the, uh, and the man that you're living with is not your husband. He doesn't do it to shame her. He does it to heal her. He's letting her know that he is what she has been looking for in all the wrong places. Uh, he's letting her know that he can satisfy the thirsting of her soul. He's letting her know that he can heal her, and he can re-engage his will for her life if she trusts in him. And it's a beautiful story of redemption when you think about it, because God seeks her out. And if that's where you are, God, God is seeking you out. And he wants you to know that your life isn't over. He's got a new beginning for you. And he wants you to know that he can heal you. And that Samaritan woman left knowing three things. God doesn't want me to be defined by my mistakes. He wants me to be defined by his grace. She left secondly knowing that God will even weave my mistakes into his plan for my life. Don't you know she becomes the first evangelist in Samaria? And then the third thing is this. Wounds always leave scars. And the scars will either remind us of our hurt or our healer. But they'll leave a scar. But the scar doesn't have to define us. It can point us to the one who heals. So I want to end by asking God to move in our situations. Whether you're in this room or you're at home, trusting God to say, God, I, I need for you to move. Uh, I need for you to heal. I need for you to make a way where there isn't a way. And we're gonna close just trusting God together in this. 
And if that's you, you're at home, I'm going to ask you to stand or if you're in this room and you say, you know what, God, I need to wait on you. I need for your healing. Would you just stand where you are in this room or at home and say, God, I'm going to wait on you. I'm going to trust in you. I'm going to seek your will in my marriage or even in my divorce so that you might make a way where there isn't a way. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, right now, I ask that you would move through your spirit in a healing way. I ask that you, through your spirit, would, would rafa, would stitch up the wounds that some of us have, and that you would kabosh, that you would bind them up. Because this is who you are. You are a God who heals. And Lord, some of us are saying, God, I need this healing in my life. I didn't bring it about. I didn't cause what happened, but I am now experiencing the wound. Lord God, heal those wounds. And Lord, some of us are saying, God, maybe I was the cause of it. I, I repent. I, I, want, I, I want to live, Lord God, unburdened of the guilt. Forgive me. I, I, I choose to walk a different way. Heal my wound. Like the Samaritan woman, heal my wound. Re-engage my will, your will for my life. In Jesus' name we pray together.